Hi, yes, thank you. <laughs> and welcome to Automate out Yourself Out of a Job with Roslyn, which is the first tech talk I've done in two years in front of people. Um, I've been happily sitting at home at my desk with my like four or five monitors and my big powerful PC. And so, yeah, it's been a while and I am a little bit terrified, so I'm sorry. Um, my name is Mark Rendell and I am a .NET developer. Uh, I've been using .NET and C Sharp since the first beta of .NET back in late 2000. Um, I'm a Microsoft MVP, which doesn't matter at all, but apparently when you're speaking you have to go, I'm a Microsoft MVP. So the only reason I do the speaking is so that I get to be a Microsoft MVP and get free software and, and, and stuff. Um, <clears throat> But my job, I work on something called Visual Recode, which I'll talk about more later on. Um, but let's start off by talking about what Roslyn actually is. So the first sort of few versions of C Sharp and the first few versions of .NET, the C Sharp compiler and the VB.NET compiler were written in C++. And then around the time of between C Sharp 5 and C Sharp 6, there was a huge project to rewrite the compiler for C Sharp in C Sharp and to re re rewrite the compiler for VB.NET in VB.NET, which serves them right. Um, <laughs> any VB.NET programmers in the room? Because I'm sorry, yeah. Um, not for what I'm saying, I'm just sorry. Um, and when they rewrote the compiler for C Sharp in C Sharp, they didn't just make a new compiler. They built it, uh, they, they decided to make a compiler as a service. So they built it in an open way so that all the developers in the world who were doing C Sharp work could hook into the compiler and use bits of the compiler toolchain to work with their own C Sharp code. And so it, essentially, we all became C Sharp compiler developers because we've got access to these parts of the C Sharp compiler. And, and it's completely awesome. Um, fundamentally, the thing it's most often used for is writing analyzers, uh, which either install into Visual Studio or you can reference them as a NuGet package in your project. And then it adds the squiggles under lines. And if you're really lucky, it adds the fix for that as well. And we'll take a look at that later on. But I got into using Roslyn basically because Microsoft cancelled WCF, which was a good move. Um, WCF needed to be cancelled. WCF was uh, started in 2006, and it was basically a way to get .NET to do SOAP. And SOAP really belongs in 2006. I mean, it doesn't belong anywhere, but if it's going to be anywhere at all, 2006 is a nice safe place for it, and let's just leave it there. I know Java people still love it, but, but no. Um, and a lot of people were very upset by this. And Microsoft said, the, the thing we suggest that you migrate to is gRPC, which is the new sort of RPC hotness. Um, it's created by Google, although the G does not stand for Google. Nobody knows what it does stand for. It just doesn't stand for Google. And so there are a bunch of people in the world who've got um, tens of millions of lines of code all wrapped up behind WCF service contracts and operation contracts and data contracts. And I thought, I wonder if you could just use Roslyn to scan over all those service contracts and data contracts and generate the protobuf file uh, that, that would be the equivalent gRPC service. And so I started hacking around with that, and it turned out, yes, yes, you can. And it's, um, I, I want to say it's surprisingly easy, but I also want people to buy my thing. So um, it's, it's kind of, yeah. Um, and I actually ended up going, not only can I do that, but I can also generate the code so that we can bring across your old service contract and then just put a gRPC proxy in front of it. And so I dug really, really deep into Roslyn and, and all that sort of stuff. And so that's uh, how I got to know about it and why I want to share it with you, because you can use it for, for things like that. You could um, put together your own visual recode and avoid buying a $125 license. Um, but you can also use it to sort of scan over a C-sharp object and generate the equivalent TypeScript object or interface or class or whatever, um, or, or lots of things. So 
To get started with Roslyn, it's essentially just a bunch of NuGet packages. Um, and they've just, with C Sharp 10, they've gone to 4.0 on the NuGet packages. And so this is what the project file would look like. Um, we have Microsoft.CodeAnalysis.CSharp.Workspaces. And that brings in Microsoft.CodeAnalysis.CSharp and a bunch of other things. And that contains all the types and classes and, and libraries that you need to start analyzing and passing and understanding and working with c -sharp code in your code. Um, we also bring in Microsoft.CodeAnalysis.Workspaces.MSBuild. And uh, that is the thing that hooks the Roslyn compiler up to a version of MS Build that is installed somewhere on your machine. And that could be the Visual Studio version of MS Build, which is closed source and scary as hell, or it could be the .NET version of MS Build that's hiding under program files slash .NET slash SDK somewhere. Um, and that lets you work with .NET Core and .NET 5 and .NET 6 and all the latest versions of C Sharp. Um, and then up at the top there, we have something called Microsoft.Build.Locator, which we'll talk about more in a minute. So at the root of everything that you do with Roslyn is workspaces, or are workspaces. Workspaces, um, are, they're like above the solution. And you can think of a workspace as like a virtual instance of Visual Studio that's running in memory and that's taking care of all the things around the solution. And so Roslyn workspaces, you have three different kinds. You have an ad hoc workspace, which is one that you can just create and then add a solution to it and then add projects to the solution and add documents to the projects. Um, and that's really helpful for unit testing and for hacking around and exploring uh, Roslyn and getting to know it. And then you have the MS Build workspace, which is the useful one that actually hooks in with the MS Build process and gives you useful information about the, the types and the code that you're working with. And then you have the Visual Studio workspace. If you install the Visual Studio extensions um, option when you're installing Visual Studio, then when you're writing an extension, you know, the VSIX thing, you can get the current uh, top-level workspace from Visual Studio and work with it inside your code. And below the workspace, we have a single solution, uh, which you can load and, uh, from a solution file, or you can create in memory if you're using an ad hoc workspace. And a solution contains multiple projects, and uh, those will be c -sharp projects or VB projects, but they can also be service fabric projects or uh, random kinds of, of all the different projects that you can have in Visual Studio, basically. And then projects contain documents. And again, some of those documents are C-sharp documents, and some of them are not. Uh, so we start out by locating a copy of MS Build, and this is what MS Build Locator is for. And so I hope this code is big enough. Um, I, I was so terrified of, of this first talk in ages um, that I sat last night in my hotel room and I ran through the demos and just screen grabbed them rather than trying to live code in front of you guys. So I apologize if you love the thrill of live coding. It's not going to happen. But the first thing you do in any Roslyn project that's running from the command line, so not in a Visual Studio extension, but if you're building a console application to do something funky, is you run this msbuildlocator.registerdefaults. And if you're running a .NET 6 console application, it will go off and it will find the .NET 6 version of MS Build. If you're running a .NET Framework 4.8 application, it will go and find the full .NET Framework version of MS Build. And then everything that you do after that will work with that version of MS Build. Super handy. It has to be, or it doesn't have to be the first thing you call in your application, but it's a hell of a good place to put it. Because if you call anything else MS Build related before you've called MS Build Locator defaults, it'll just randomly choose an MS Build environment based on alphabetical order or the position of the sun or something, and you won't know what the hell's going on. So then we create an MS Build workspace, 
and we can load a solution into it. And we add an event handler to workspace.workspace failed so that if there are any compiler errors or problems loading that solution, uh, you will get them printed out there and you can see uh, why things are not working. There is a problem with this which I found out the very, very hard way. If you use the .NET Core version of Roslyn and you try to load a full .NET Framework solution into it, it will not work because the MS build that is used for the full .NET Framework has a whole bunch of targets files and those targets files reference a whole bunch of full .NET Framework DLLs which don't work in .NET Core. And so uh, you will just, you'll, it'll look like it's working, but then you'll find out that actually half the projects are showing as having no documents at all and you can't find the things that you're looking for. And those three months that you spent refactoring the engine of your visual recode tool to run externally as a gRPC process because you thought that would be good because Visual Studio is only 32-bit doesn't actually work and you have to put it all back into Visual Studio. And then Microsoft released Visual Studio 2022, and that adds, anyway, that's my problem. <laughs> Visual Studio 2022 is at least 64-bit, so my terrible code is no longer going to cause out-of-memory exceptions as long as you've got 128 gigs of RAM installed in your PC. And why would you try to run Visual Studio if you don't? OK, so we've got a our solution and all our projects loaded into memory. So what's the basic unit of code, of C-sharp code, when we want to work with that in Roslyn? Well, we start off with syntax trees. So the way the compiler works and the way most compilers work these days is you throw a load of text at it and it tokenizes it and works out which bits uh, of the text are individual components and those can be keywords or open braces or comments or attributes or method names or identifiers or whatever and it turns that into a syntax tree and syntax trees uh, we have at the top level we have a syntax tree and then we have a syntax node so the tree is a collection of nodes and every single tiny smallest possible unit of code becomes a node in that syntax tree and we have syntax tokens, so a keyword is a syntax token, an identifier is a syntax token, uh, an open brace is a syntax token, and we also have syntax trivia. And this is all the stuff in your code that is not actually code. So comments are trivia, and white space is trivia, and all of these things are contained in this syntax tree. And if you have installed the Visual Studio SDK, you get a really handy thing built into Visual Studio that helps you understand this syntax tree, which is called the syntax visualizer. And you can go to view other, and about two thirds of the way down, there is a syntax visualizer, no, one third of the way down, uh, there is a syntax visualizer option. And then you can dock that to the right side of your document well. And as you click around your code in the other side, you can see where that is in the syntax tree. And this is a fantastic way. When you're first starting with Roslyn and you want to understand how syntax trees work, just load a little bit of code up, nice simple bit of code, and then just click around it and watch what's happening in the syntax tree on the other side. And you can see the node that you've got currently selected, and then down the bottom there's a nice property view that shows you all the properties that that node has. So that lets you get to grips with how the syntax tree works in your head and, and the concepts behind it. So then you want to start navigating that syntax in your code. And there are two ways of doing this, two primary ways of doing this. And the first one, and the simplest one for most C-sharp developers, is to use link. Because in the same way as we have link to XML, and you can say elements dot elements dot elements dot elements and, and do a, a nested query down into your, uh, your XML document, you can use link and do these queries down into your syntax tree. And so that looks like this. 
So we've got our solution loaded, which came from our workspace, and we pass that into our, um, our little demo function here. And we say, for each var document in solution.projects.selectmanyp.document, so we get all the documents in the entire solution, and then we say, uh, get the syntax root for this document. So that gets us the root node of the syntax tree for that document. If it's not a C-sharp document, then that will come back as null, so we can just ignore it. And that could be sort of an app settings.json file or any of the things that are included in the project. And then we can go into root.descendant nodes. So there's a root.child nodes, which is just the first level of nodes below the root. Root.descendant nodes is essentially an I enumerable of every single node in that entire document. And so we can go through that, and we can say we want to look for base type declaration syntax. So every node has a type that ends with syntax. And a class declaration, or an interface declaration, or an enum declaration, or a struct, or a record now in C Sharp uh, 9 and 10, uh, will be some type. So class is class declaration syntax. Interface is interface declaration syntax. I'll leave you to imagine what the rest of them might be. But they all inherit from base type declaration syntax. So we can grab that out there. And then that type declaration syntax node has an identifier property which says this is what this thing is called. And we can use that. We can get the text property out of there. We can get the namespace uh, by, so the namespace declaration syntax. If we do first ancestor or self, we can move back up the syntax tree looking for the first node type that matches that. And so that will be the namespace that contains the class declaration. And then we can put those two together and just write them out to the console. And that will look like this. This is like seriously meta demo here because I'm running the application against itself. And so it's kind of enumerating through its own code and printing it out to the console line. So that works quite nicely. Um, but you can end up with some extremely complicated link code. And you can end up doing some nasty things that are not necessarily particularly performant. And that becomes important later on when you're trying to write an analyzer, because essentially your analyzer, Visual Studio, is going to try and run it every time the user presses a key or every time the user types a character into their document. So that's not necessarily the best way to traverse your code. And so we also have Syntax Walker. And just to be absolutely clear here, there is a, a third type called Syntax Visitor, which is like Syntax Walker. And it's easy to get them mixed up. But the difference is, and, and it's important to remember this, Syntax Walker is good, and Syntax Visitor is absolutely useless. Don't use it. So with a syntax walker, you inherit from the uh, syntax, C Sharp syntax walker base class. And then for every type of syntax node, it has a virtual on visit um, or visit method that you can override. So if I want to find class declarations, I can override visit class declaration. If I want to find interface declarations and method declarations and parameters and everything in your uh, code, there is an override method in there for it. The really nice thing is with IntelliSense, you can just type override and then spend a happy 15 minutes scrolling up and down the IntelliSense and going, oh, yes, you can visit those. And so this gives us a very efficient way of walking across the entire uh, syntax tree uh, using basically the visitor pattern. But it's, it's, it's not, don't use C Sharp syntax visitor, because it only goes one level, and then you don't get the things that you're expecting. So you want C Sharp syntax walker, although that is an implementation of the visitor pattern. Visitor is a bad implement, anyway. So yes, so this is another way of doing this. And then to use this, these two screens are in the wrong order. Um, we just create a new instance of that list types walker. And then we go through the documents. And for each document, we do get syntax root async. And then we just say walker.visit uh, and pass that syntax document in. And it will basically go through that in roughly the same way. You can also say uh, root.accept 
and pass the walker in there as well. That will work too. Um, I have no opinion on which one of those is the best way to go. And so that produces exactly the same output as the previous uh, <laughs> demo, but is uh, technically it's a better way of, of working with the code. It's a more efficient and memory uh, friendly way of working with the code. But what we've got here is just essentially the tokens wrapped in a nice tree that makes it easy to find them and navigate them and visit them and, and do whatever we want to do. We don't actually know what any of them mean. So we might find a, a token that says string with a capital S, and we might think, OK, so that's going to be system.string. But not necessarily. You could be working for a company that sells string. And so it has an object called string that they use all over the place. And so if it's lowercase string, the keyword string, then it's probably system.string. But if it's an uppercase s, then it could be the string that they sell. And we don't know. And trying to work that out, so going back up and finding all the using statements and seeing if you've got using system in there, and does that then mean string? But is there a using string equals string co.string? Um, it, it becomes complicated. Fortunately, all of that is taken care of for us, because this is not just a C-sharp parser. This is the whole C-sharp compiler. And so we have something called semantic models. And these are the thing that really helps you to work with your code and know what's going on. So we compile our project. So we can say await project dot get compilation async. And if the project's already been compiled, that will just load stuff from the assembly. And if not, it will compile it and then load stuff from the assembly. And then we can get the model for that compilation uh, from, uh, we can get the model for the syntax tree that we're working with from that compilation. So we've got the document, and we've got the syntax tree out of it, and we can say, hey, give me more intelligence, give me more information about this syntax tree. And what we work with then is symbols. So for every one of those syntax types, class declaration syntax and uh, method declaration syntax, all those sorts of things, there is an equivalent symbol in the semantic model. And we can grab that. So for each of these documents, we can get the syntax tree, and we can compile the project, and then we can uh, go through and we can combine this with our link queries. So we can say, for this document, get me all the type declarations. And then we can pass that in to our uh, model and say, give me the declared symbol for this type declaration syntax. And that will give you an I named type symbol, which is a lot more information. So that'll tell you uh, everything about that type. And then you, that's got properties inside it. So you can enumerate through methods and properties and fields and constructors and everything about it. And you can get full type information, namespace qualified, so you can see if something is system.string or string company.string uh, and, and work through your code like that. And it makes it so, so much easier. So you can see here that we're getting the I named type symbol for our type declaration syntax. And then we can go through that, and we can say symbol.getMembers and give me the uh, method symbols from this type symbol. And that will give you all the methods, public, private, internal, and everything else. And then we've got this method symbol. One of the properties on there is implicitly declared. So the c -sharp compiler, bless its little heart, will generate a whole bunch of methods uh, while it's compiling the code. So if you have a property with a getter and a setter, then the c -sharp compiler will generate two methods for that property to set the hidden field that it's created for you. Uh, and so we can use method symbol dot is implicitly declared to throw away all the stuff that's been generated by the C-sharp compiler. And this works with async methods and various other weird things that happen in C-sharp as well. It's fascinating, actually, just to go through the, uh, the syntax tree or the, the symbol in the debugger and just explore all the 
ethereal stuff that the C-sharp compiler gets up to behind your back. So the output from that, um, we have well, the auto-generated extensions has an is auto-generated method and a begins with auto-generated comment method, and then we've got our Roslyn demo dot dependency demo, and so we get a lot more information this way, uh, and we can actually reason about the types that uh, we have in our solution. There is a symbol visitor class which works a bit like the C# -sharp syntax walker class, except. Uh, I have I tried to use it when I was first getting started with Roslyn, and I found it less than useful. Um, so I don't tend to use it a lot, but you can. You can create a symbol visitor, which looks like this, and it works in exactly the same way as the syntax walker. You pass a, a semantic model object, like an iname type symbol or something, into it, and it goes through and it visits all the items below that uh, in the... Um, in the symbol. But I tend to just go through the properties and sort of get members to of type method symbol and that sort of thing. Uh, but so, yeah, we can see here we've got a visit named type. And then if we go into that, we can find all the named types within our um, symbol, whatever that might be. And if it's the top level, then it would be like an I namespace symbol. And then within that, we can revisit using the same visitor um, to find method symbols. So this doesn't traverse down the entire tree. You actually have to take control of it and say, OK, when you find a name type, then go into it and visit it again, looking for method symbols. And uh, visit property and visit method will print things out to the console like this. And so now we can see uh, that none of the classes I have in this demo have any properties, which is completely pointless. But, uh, yeah. So let's talk about doing something useful with this. Uh, let's see if we can find all the types that are used by all the code in our project. So we can go in to our solution, and we can say, go through each project. And for each project, we're going to get the compilation, which is the in-memory proper representation of, of what everything means. And then we can go through the documents, and we can check to see if the document is auto-generated. And this is actually really important in modern uh, C-sharp code as well, because as of C-sharp 8 or 9, um, and .NET core projects in particular, uh, you might have noticed we don't have an assembly info.cs file in our .NET or .NET Core projects anymore, because it's auto-generated from the CS proj file. But it is hiding there somewhere in your project, and it will be one of the documents that gets enumerated when you go to project.documents. It's kind of assemblyinfo.g.cs. And now we also have source generators, which are generating random code, which is also hiding in our documents tree somewhere, and we don't necessarily want to be going through those. So I've got an extension method called uh, is auto generated, which looks for a comment at the top of the file containing the words auto generated, or looks to see if the document extension is .g.cs. Uh, if you have something that is generating code, and if you're into the idea of source generators, and you didn't go to the talk that was in uh, here or room five yesterday. Uh, somebody did a very good talk about source generators, which would be great to watch after this one. Um, then, uh, and if you came here thinking this was going to be about source generators, I apologize. Um, please feel free to, to complain. Um, but yes, so if it's not auto, if it's auto generated, ignore it. Um, otherwise, get the syntax tree and then get the root of that syntax tree. Uh, check just one more time to make sure it's really not auto-generated. Um, and then get the semantic model. And for each of the named type symbols that we have in this syntax node, which we get here, uh, we have name type. So we go node.descendant nodes dot of type identifier name syntax. So that is a... Uh, a, a variable declaration or a property declaration or something like that. And we also have expression syntax, which is going to be like a literal string or 3 plus 2 or A plus B or any sort of anything that's an expression and not a statement. And from that, 
If you have an expression that is, uh, you've got two integers and you, uh, called a and b, then you have an expression a plus b, and the type of that expression is int. And so you can get that name type symbol back out and say this is an integer expression. And then we can return those back, and then we can do uh, this, which shows us every type that is used by any of those identifiers or expressions in your entire project. And you could use this, for example, to go, am I using anything from system.link.xml? And if I'm not, then I can remove the reference to system.link.xml from my project. But the fun bit comes when you start rewriting code when you want to make changes to code or you want to generate a new version of code, when you're going through .NET 4 code and looking for things that won't work in .NET 6 and putting comments around it to say, don't do this, or putting if defs around it, or that sort of thing. And reload in Roslyn at first is extremely challenging because there's a feature th that's built into Roslyn that was a fundamental design goal right from the start, and that is immutability. So things in Roslyn are immutable. Syntax nodes are immutable. If you change them, it becomes a new syntax node. And this goes right the way through the whole compiler project. What things in Roslyn are immutable? Everything. Literally everything. Anything that you change will create a new version of that thing, which you then have to say, this is now the actual version of this thing that I want to use. So the solution. If you change a syntax node in a document somewhere, you have created a new version of the solution right at the top level. God knows what this does to memory. It, it horrifies me. But there's everything in here is immutable. Um, does anybody use system.collections.immutable, the NuGet package? It, it's super handy. You've got immutable dictionaries and immutable arrays and immutable lists and immutable hash maps. Um, and every list or array anywhere in Roslyn is going to be one of those collection types. That entire NuGet package was basically created by the Roslyn team because they needed it for their compiler. And so that makes it quite difficult if you're just linking or visiting through your nodes. If you change something, how do you make that flow back so that that becomes the canonical version of the solution? And so we don't work in that way when we're trying to rewrite code. We use the c -sharp syntax rewriter. And this is just like the c -sharp syntax walker but where the c -sharp syntax walker, all the methods return void, in the c -sharp syntax rewriter, all the methods return a syntax node. So you take a syntax node in, and if you want to change it, then you modify it and you return your modified syntax node back out of the method. Uh, if you don't want to change it, you return the original node that you were passed in, or actually you return literal expression because you never know what's going on in the base method. Might be nothing, always best to call it. Um, and if you want to remove the syntax node entirely, if you just go, no, that's a terrible syntax node, I don't like it, I want it to go away, then you can return null and it will disappear forever. Uh, and if you do that accidentally and then ship the code that does it, you can make people very, 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 very unhappy. I know. So this is how we do this from the top level. We go through our projects, and we get our compilation, and then we go through our uh, documents, and we get our syntax root, and then we create a string literal upshifter, which is the most useful utility uh, class in the entire world. It will just go through your entire c -sharp project, and it will find any literal strings you have anywhere in the whole thing, and it will add to upper invariant at the end of them. And then your application will become shouty. Um, I, I am thinking of releasing this as an actual Visual Studio extension and just calling it shouty um, and seeing how many people download it and install it. That could be fun. 
I only have one Visual Studio. I've got two Visual Studio extensions. One is Visual Recode. Um, the other, which sadly doesn't work anymore, uh, was just called No Git. And all it did, you know, it's impossible to turn off the Git integration in Visual Studio. And all it did back in Visual Studio 2015 was every time it got turned on, it turned it off again. Um, it was surprisingly popular. But anyway, back to this. <laughs> um, so we get the semantic model, and then we pass, uh, we create a new string literal upshifter. So this is a syntax walker, but we want to have the information about the, uh, the we want the semantic model passed into it. And so when you're creating a C sharp syntax walker or a C sharp syntax rewriter, you get the model, and then you pass it in when you create the rewriter or the visitor or the walker, um, and then it can use it internally. And then you just say, create a new route by passing this route into that syntax rewriter. And then when you get that back, uh, there is a is equivalent to method that will compare two syntax trees and work out if they are the same. Um, because you might get the same syntax tree back. You might sort of think you've made changes, but actually you haven't. And so you use this is equivalent to to say, are these basically the same code? If it's not, then we actually have to call solution dot with document syntax root, which will update the solution, update the project, and uh, and make the new solution the one that includes those changes. And then at the end, we have to say. If the new solution is not the same as the solution that is in the current workspace, then we call workspace.tryapplyChanges and pass our new solution in. And this gets really fun because if some other code running on some other thread at the same time has also made changes to the solution which are incompatible with yours, this is essentially like a git merge and you could have conflicts. And so when you call workspace.tryapplyChanges, what you should be doing is checking the Boolean result. And if it's false, that means the changes you're trying to make conflict with the changes that some other bit of code has made somewhere. And what you need to do is go right back up to the top and start again with the current solution and hope that it doesn't happen the second time through. Three or four times around that loop is usually enough, depending on how many extensions and how many analyzers you have included in your project. So that would take this code here and turn it into this code here. Um, and, and that's basically it. That's, that's a syntax rewriter. I will put all this code up onto GitHub um, at the end of the talk so that you can actually go and, and find it and do useful things with it. So that's fun, and you can write code that generates C-sharp code, and you can write code that reads C-sharp code and then generates other things based on it, uh, and you can do fun stuff with that. If you don't like docfx, then you could write your own docfx by going through and finding the, uh, the doc comments on all your members. But the point at which this becomes really useful is with Roslyn analyzers, which I mentioned at the start. So you might notice these days, uh, if you use XUnit, it comes with its own squiggles. And it tells you that um, if you've got a theory, and then you've got uh, inline parameters, and the number of arguments you put in the inline parameters doesn't match the number of arguments in your test method, you'll get a, a squiggle that pops up under the theory that says, this isn't going to work. Uh, and there's a whole bunch of stuff in there. And most Microsoft projects, ASP.NET Core comes with a bunch of analyzers that help you ASP.NET Core properly. Entity Framework Core comes with a bunch of analyzers that help you do that properly. Weirdly enough, Roslyn comes with a bunch of analyzers that pops up squiggles and says, you're doing Roslyn wrong. We've used Roslyn to work out that you're doing Roslyn wrong. How meta would you like this to get? So the, the really helpful thing with this, if you work in a company where you've got some shared code, uh, you've got something that you do a lot, and you've written a, a nice utility library to wrap around it to help you work with that, or you've got a shared repository project, or, or whatever, you can 
write your own analyzers and include them in the same NuGet package um, as, a, as a dependency. And then when people uh, download your library and try to use it, you can help them. You can be there looking over their shoulder and going, oh, no, that's, that's not the right way to do that. Um, I was working at uh, one of the large banks and working in a WPF application. And we were trying to work out why the hell it was so slow. And the answer turned out to be because we wrote it in WPF, obviously. Um, but we thought we should do what we can to try and make it faster. And so I spent a lot of time instrumenting the entire application so that we could see how long various things that were happening as Windows were created was. And to do this, we were one team, and there were about 10,000 developers at this bank, and about 2,500 of them use .NET. And if you want to introduce a new package, like app metrics, for example, um, into that ecosystem, that's about six months of meetings and filling out forms and, and putting a case together and everything else. If you want to bring in something from system, something from Microsoft, that's no problem at all. And Microsoft, uh, as part of the .NET Core project, created this thing called system.diagnostics.diagnostics.source, which essentially let you track activities and create events and everything else, and then you could just read those out and write them to wherever you want to write them to, an influx database or Prometheus or something like that. And so I introduced this idea of using diagnostic source. Um, so you work with that, you create a diagnostic listener, and when you call it, you just write a string to identify what your event was, and then an anonymous object which contains effectively all the tags and useful information and the name of the window and the thread ID and all that sort of stuff that you might want. And the key thing here is we have a WPF application and we're trying to make it faster. And I want to add code. <laughs> and so people are going, that's going to slow it down. And so Diagnostic Source has this thing where if you've attached a listener to it, then it will, uh, it will do something. But if you haven't attached a listener to it, then you can just ignore it. And so doing this is wrong, because every time this static void bar gets called, we're going to create a new anonymous object and set A to 42. We don't want to do that. What we want to do is check to see if the diagnostic source is actually enabled, if something's listening to it and is listening for the event we're about to post, then we call diagnostic right. Now, this is a nightmare. Who uses Microsoft.extensions.logging in their code? Who, every time you call underscore logger.loginformation, prefixes that with if logger.isenabled log level.information? Bad, bad people. Bad. You should. If you look in the .NET Core code, if you look in the ASP.NET Core code, they do that. Actually, .NET 6, people are so terrible at this that .NET 6 now includes source generators. So you can create a log method, and it will generate that boilerplate code for you and prevent allocations and prevent logging from happening at all and creating objects and doing all this sort of stuff. And so I wanted something like that for this diagnostic source, so that when you said diagnostics.write something, it would do the little squiggle and say, you should check to see if this source is enabled, and ideally be able to add that bit of code to say if diagnostic source dot is enabled. So if you go into Visual Studio project templates, you will find one of them is analyzer with code fix .NET standard. These are the Roslyn-based templates. And analyzer with code fix .NET standard will create a project that has your analyzer and um, <clears throat> a unit test project, so you can test your analyzer, and a VSIX project, so if you want to, you can package your analyzer up as a Visual Studio extension and distribute it through the marketplace or just email a VSIX to your friends. And an analyzer has two important components. 
One of them is the diagnostic analyzer. That's the thing that looks at the code and returns something out to say, that's not right, you've done it wrong, you're the worst programmer ever, you should have been a farmer. And the code fix provider, which is the thing that jumps in for you and goes, never mind, farming's a dying industry anyway, let's see if we can help you get this right. So this is an analyzer. It has a crap load of boilerplate code. The thing I really like about it is that the boilerplate code causes squiggles. So the boilerplate code for writing an analyzer is triggering the analyzer that's analyzing the boilerplate. Like I say, this gets really um, recursive. But no, so we have a diagnostic descriptor uh, which says this is the, uh, the description. This is what this thing is looking for. Um, we've got some localizable strings, which I've collapsed there because I don't localize my code, just speak English. Um, <coughs> uh, and we have uh, a list of supported diagnostics so that we can tell essentially the Visual Studio runtime or the Rider runtime or, by the way, pro tip, who uses Visual Studio code? Who misses all the helpful sort of things from ReSharper or Visual Studio when you're editing C-Sharp code? So if you go into the settings, in the C-Sharp extension settings in Visual Studio code, there is a checkbox which is not checked by default that says Enable Analyzers. And if you turn that on, you get Extract Method and uh, Initialize Read-Only Field and all the things that you have in Visual Studio. Apparently, the reason it's turned off is because it uses a bit of memory, but we're developers. We've got memory to spare, unless we work for a big enterprise company who doesn't know why we can't use the same spec of machine to develop the software that other people use to run the software. And, and if that's you, then I feel your pain. Then we get down to the bit that actually does something useful. We have our analyze mode, analyze node method, and in here, we can look at the uh, node that we get from our analysis context, and we can say, is this a diagnostic method, diagnostic source method invocation? Is it uh, calling write on a diagnostic source? And we're going to pass in our semantic model, which we're also getting from the context there, which is coming from the current compilation of the project. And then we can call another method that says, is this guarded? Is there an um, is enabled? check around it anywhere. And if it's not, then we can return a diagnostic that will then generate the handy green or red squiggles. Um, and we can control that with this diagnostic severity.warning. So if you do diagnostic severity.warning, that's green squiggles. If you do diagnostic severity.error, that's red squiggles. So our is guarded method looks like this. Uh, we can look at the expression and say, um, is that a literal expression syntax? So are we calling um, is enabled on, on the literal? Um, <clears throat> otherwise, do we have a matching symbol um, that has is enabled called on it? Matching symbol exists can just look back up the parents of our current syntax node and see if any of them are an if statement. And if they are an if statement, then is the expression inside that if statement acting on our diagnostic source um, symbol? And if it is, is it calling the uh, is enabled? So we got this um, is diagnostic source method invocation is enabled. And if we don't find that anywhere between our diagnostic source dot write and the top of wherever we get to, so like the method declaration or property declaration, um, then we're going to say, if we find it, we say, yes, it's being called. Otherwise, we just return false out of this. Similar thing when we're looking with literals, going back up, and we have to match symbols and literals because the, in the node that we're looking at could be either of those. And then, so that will generate the green squiggles saying, hey, you're using diagnostic source dot write without an is enable check. So that's told the programmer that they're a bad person and should rethink their life choices. And then we have the code fix provider. 
And these are a little bit more complicated to write, but essentially uh, we are going to find, so we register our code fixes, we say these are the diagnostic source, or the diagnostic warnings. It was a bad idea to use this because I'm talking about Visual Studio diagnostics on one hand and then this diagnostic source on the other hand. I, I'll fix this for the next time I do this talk. So yeah, we basically say we have a code fix for when you get that warning saying diagnostic source should be guarded with an is enabled call. And so we can register our code fix here. And then we have this bit of code here. And it's quite dense, but I think this really highlights the fact that Roslyn is incredibly powerful and enables you to do some really quite clever things with a fairly minimal amount of code and without really having to know too much about compilers and, and syntax trees and everything else. Because this is a, a method that fits on a single screen at 1920 by 1080 with a reasonable font size. And this is enough to wrap that diagnostic source.write with an if diagnostic source is enabled. So we just say uh, we've got our expression which is going to be our diagnostic source.write. And we can just get the leading trivia off it, whatever that might be, which is probably white space. And then into at the end of the white space, we can just add if diagnostic source is enabled. Going to step out here and use the laser pointer to point out where these things are happening. It's very precarious up here. Um, so yes. Uh, so we've got is enabled here. We're going to pass a syntax factory. So this is what lets us generate C sharp code in our, um, our code fix. And so we're going to pass this expression, and we're just going to say source dot is enabled. So source is whatever the identifier for our diagnostic source instance was. And so we can just pass this and say source dot is enabled, and that will give us an invocation expression syntax. And then we can replace the argument list in that, which will be empty, with a new argument list, which adds in the argument which was the first thing passed to um, our diagnostic source.write invocation. So in this case, that, that would be bar. And then we can create a new if statement. And so this pass expression lets us turn a C-sharp string into a C-sharp syntax node. But syntax factory, also, you can just say create an if statement. And the if keyword should be this token, uh, syntax kind dot if keyword. And then we're going to add an open paren token, uh, because we need that. And then we're going to put our is enabled expression inside that there. And then we're going to have our close paren token and add on trailing trivia new line. And then we can indent the expression underneath that. I don't know what that else does. Don't worry about it. And then we're going to add back on whatever the leading trivia was on this thing before we started dicking around with it, which should give us the same level of indentation as we had before. Then we can just go, hey, give us the solution from the document that we're looking at, and give us the syntax root from this document. And then we can replace the node that was our old expression up here with our new if statement. And then we can do that same thing again and say uh, the new solution is the original solution with this change to our document syntax, and then return the new solution back. So yeah, there's a lot going on. And it's not the simplest thing in the world. But for what it's doing and how easily that integrates with Visual Studio and is able to provide helpful um, tweaks to your code as you're going along, uh, you, can, you can see that it's, uh, it's, it's quite a powerful tool um, that you can use. Uh, and you can use this, like I say, you can ship analyzers with code fixes, uh, with shared projects internally, with stuff with NuGet packages that you publish on your internal NuGet package um, server. If you have uh, particular styles of coding that you like to enforce, um, then you can use this to enforce those coding styles. Uh, you can say this is an error. 
Um, and these analyzers will also be run during the compilation process, and they will put their warnings and errors into the uh, compiler output. And so if you want to say, if you're one of those places where they're not allowed to use the var keyword, then you could write an analyzer that looks for the var keyword and reports that as an error, and uh, then add things to source control so that you can't check in code that won't compile. And it won't compile because you've got an analyzer in there that says the var keyword isn't allowed. Because um, why, why don't people like I never understand why people don't like the var keyword. It's great. But yeah. Um, you'll also have a test project generated. It will be an MS test test project for, for reasons. Um, but it makes it very easy to test that your analyzer is going to work. Uh, and so you just have your, your test fixture, which inherits from code fix verifier, which includes a bunch of methods that uh, are helpful to make sure that your diagnostic is working. And so you can say uh, verify C sharp diagnostic on uh, the test string there and make sure that that. Um, doesn't return any diagnostics. If you've got an empty string, then you're definitely not calling diagnostic source.write, so that's not going to show any diagnostics. Uh, you can then pass in a method that does um, take, that does call diagnostic source.write, and you can check that the uh, diagnostic is triggered. And so you can make sure that your analyzer is working with the code that is important to you. And then you can also check the um, fix code is working by passing in the code that should trigger the diagnostic and the fix, and then also the code that is what it should look like after the code fix has been run. Um, this is super handy. This is so much easier, because the other way of testing this is to press F5 and have it launch a new Visual Studio instance with that analyzer switched on, and then type code inside it and make sure it triggers and all this sort of stuff. Um, and uh, another, it's a damn good thing I decided to do this. Um, let's run through all the demos and screen grab them and just turn them into slides. Because when I tried to run this project last night, it didn't because it was written for Visual Studio 2019, and I've only got Visual Studio 2022 um, Preview 1 installed on this laptop, and it just didn't work. But trust me, if I had Visual Studio 2019, I could demo it right now, and it would work brilliantly. Um, but you'll just have to take my word for it. <laughs> so um, yes, here we have. This is what it should look like. And then we can just call verify C sharp fix, which is a method provided by that code fix verifier base class that says, yep, after I apply the diagnostic uh, code fix, uh, this is what the new code looks like. So that's basically it. Um, and uh, I've done that. I never get to the end of my talks with two minutes to spare. Let, just hang on. I'll think of a tangent to go off on for five minutes. Um, so yeah. No, uh, if you want to learn more about this, um, the thing I found super useful when I was starting out and trying to understand why my C-sharp syntax visitor wasn't doing what I wanted it to do and that I should be using C-sharp syntax walker instead, uh, joshvarty.com slash learnroslin now was the resource I used to get my head around all of this sort of stuff. Also, on GitHub, there is a .NET analyzers organization that has a whole bunch of refactorings and code fix providers and analyzers that you can use to crib from and copy and paste from. And I'm writing a song about that. Um, if you have a .NET 4 application and you're looking to migrate to .NET Core, then please take a look at visualrecode.com. Um, it's, it's, uh, it's a work in progress, but it will currently take your WCF application and turn it into a gRPC application. And we're working on making it do useful things with MVC and Web API and and other things as well. And that is basically it. Um, I hope that was useful. I hope that's given you some ideas that you can go off and start hacking on and do fun stuff with. 
Uh, later on today at seven o'clock in room three, I will be hosting some fun talks ahead of the party, which is just speakers talking about things that they wouldn't be allowed to talk about in an actual talk. Um, and then the band Dylan Beatty and the Line Breakers will be on later, and I'll be fucking singing because I got drunk once and went, yeah, all right. Um, so yeah, come to that. And last slot tomorrow, if you're still around at the end of the conference, not sure what room it's in, but I'm doing a completely stupid talk about the worst programming language ever, which is lots of fun. So if your brain's melted by the end of the conference, then come along to that. Other than that, five seconds to go. I've been Mark Rendell. Thank you very much for coming, and I'll see you again. Cheers. Bang on! Bang on zero!